We'll uh, go right into our study this morning. I don't know if uh, Vivid has our camera running, but I'd like to give a message to all those that participate in um, our service, both live and also uh, online. So if you are ready, uh, we're good to go. I, and the reason is, I want to address uh, for just a moment the reason that we are studying the legitimacy of Ellen G. White as a prophetess. Uh, it's interesting that over the last few weeks, uh, we've had many responses online and in person, and also uh, uh, by uh, email or uh, by text messages to me directly. I'm grateful for the messages, even those that are a little hostile, because I know that this will cause you to study. And I hope that you will study with an open mind. Um, I would encourage those that are listening to or reviewing these messages that rather than personal attacks or rather than personal responses, that we refer to Scripture and we refer to, um, in this case, Ellen White, because we are discussing Ellen White, and go back and do some research for yourself and satisfy yourself. As you note, I have continuously said that it is not only proper, but hopefully expected that you will double check everything that is being presented here. Point number two. Uh, I don't think that it is inappropriate to question Ellen White because Ellen White herself made statements stating that what I am writing and what I am teaching is either from God or from Satan. This is her own uh, plea, challenge to those around her to test what she writes and what she teaches, to see if it is biblical and true. And she says, it's either from God or from Satan. Her words, not mine. Therefore, I challenge you to please do that. Why? Because we need to cross-check everything against the Word of God. Why is it important for us to be studying Ellen White? Let me explain that. The Bible teaches from Genesis to Revelation that our God, the Creator, the one who made us, He provided before the foundations of this earth a plan of salvation for us, which was that when we sin, he will make provision for our redemption to be brought back to Him through grace, through His mercy. And He provided that the payment of our sins will be made by the death of one Messiah, a Savior that was going to come. And when we accept Him by faith, the grace of God and His mercy would forgive us and bring us into redemption, bring, them, bring us back to Him, that we may be with Him as He planned. From Genesis to Revelation, that is the plan of redemption, that God would make way for us to come back to Him by grace and by grace 
alone. We find this in the covenants that God provided to us. The covenant of Eden. We won't include Noah and his covenant in those covenants. But definitely the foundational covenant of Abraham. Through grace and through faith, God accepted Abraham. And through his seed and through the promised land where the seed could prosper would come a Messiah, the king whose kingdom would last forever, who would save the whole of humanity. And in that covenant, God gave him the third promise that through him all nations would be blessed and saved by grace. He then reviewed that Covenant. He strengthened it with the covenant of Moses, where he gave the law. So through the law, we could see sin. And part of that moral law, the covenant, the moral law, there was a civil law and there was a sanctuary law. The law which followed the confession of sin and salvation by grace. God promised if they keep certain of those commands, they would inherit that promised land called Canaan. But the moral law he put in the Ark of the Covenant and covered it with a mercy seat, knowing that salvation would only be given to them by his mercy. And the confession of sin and the sacrifice of animals, which projected forward to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. What does all of that have to do with Ellen White? Jesus, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection fulfilled the prophecies that God gave through his prophets in the Old Testament that a Messiah was going to come and die for us. And those prophecies were in fact fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And recorded in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Which look back to the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That the salvation was complete. And then the writings of the Apostle Paul. Open our eyes to the Gospel. The understanding of the good news. And when that Gospel recorded, the story recorded in the Gospels and explained in the writings of Ellen, uh, the, the writings of the Apostle Paul, when, those, when that Gospel becomes clear, it gets buried again. Approximately about 70 years after the Apostle Paul begins to get buried by the church as it begins to begin paganized, begin to teach salvation by works rather than by faith. Comes the Reformation. And of all the other things that the Reformation brought to light, the foundational teaching of the Reformation was the uncovering of this very message of salvation by grace alone. Salvation by grace alone. And in that message, in order to make sure that that message was the crowning message and the foundational message of the Bible, the reformers also required that the message of God requires that we depend not on tradition of that church that had become pagan, but on the Bible alone, nothing else. And the reformation taught that we're saved by faith alone. Further, by grace alone, that's it. By Christ alone, by the perfectness of Jesus Christ, the sinlessness of Jesus Christ, that is the only thing that saves us, not our works. And lastly, that the glory for our salvation goes to God alone and not to us and our works. 
But the church in which I grew up, and this is part of the reason that it's important for me to teach that I have to cleanse myself of the teachings of the church in which I grew up. Because that church buried once again what was uncovered by the Reformation and held up the teaching of righteousness by works as opposed to righteousness by grace. And in order for me to uncover within my own history, within my own spiritual heritage, in order for me to uncover once again the message of grace alone, I need to go back and examine those people and those teachings that had an influence on me. And my ancestors, my father, my mother, my relatives, and those people whom I misled to the Seventh-day Adventist Church and baptized as a pastor and as an evangelist, an evangelist to crusades. I need to uncover the truth publicly. And for those that sit before me today, and those that watch online, it is important to clean ourselves of the lies that covered the only message that God had for us, that through his love, he will save us by grace alone. And in order to do that, I need to go over many, many doctrines and teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which are not biblical, and I want to review this with you. But in order for me to disprove those teachings, I have no choice but to go to the source that verified and confirmed those teachings to be of God. Therefore, I need to examine Ellen White to know if her teachings were from God. Because as long as Ellen White and her teachings are strong, those doctrines remain strong. But in order to understand and compare those doctrines and take them only from the Bible, we have no choice but to show the lies and teachings of Ellen White. Those doctrines will include, and I will do that, will include that date, 1844, more specifically October 22nd, 1844. That it, in fact, is a heresy. It is a wrong way to guide people as to when Christ will return or any unseen activity is going to take place in heaven by a date. We will uncover the fallacy of that date. We want to talk about the shut door theology. That in 1844, God shut the door for any more people to be saved. If a prophet tells you that, that means anybody born after that date is going straight to hell. I want to discuss the Seventh-day Adventist teaching that the observance of the Sabbath, and more specifically, they don't call it the observance of the Sabbath, they call it the worship on the Sabbath. Very specific. To worship on the Sabbath is a seal of God. I will show you that it is not. And as I do that, I will explain that I believe that God expects all his followers to observe the seventh day Sabbath as I do. Not that I would be the example, but as I'm just stating that I believe that it is required. It's important for us to call, follow the seventh day Sabbath. I believe that's biblical. But to state that it is the seal of God when Christ returns, another fallacy. To state that those that worship on Sunday, once again, the word worship, not observe the Sabbath, not observe Sunday as a Sabbath. Those that worship on Sunday are those 
that will receive the mark of the beast. This is the teaching of the Adventist church. I will prove that it is not true. Most importantly, the doctrine of the investigative judgment. Complete heresy. If there's anything that is anti-Christ, I don't have to look to the Pope. This teaching itself minimizes, diminishes, cancels salvation by grace and teaches that I have to be perfect, spiritually sinless before God in order to be saved. The 144,000, who are the 144,000? I will show you that the Adventist interpretation and the teaching of Ellen White is wrong. This arrogant belief that the Seventh-day Adventist church is the remnant church of God, utter nonsense. No single denomination, no single church is a remnant church of God. Utter nonsense, which makes people smug about their membership in a church that teaches heresies. The question of righteousness by works in that the church teaches and supports Ellen White who says that when the character of God is duplicated, reproduced in the people of God, then Christ will return. The teaching that the writings of Ellen White is a doctrine of the Adventist church, and I think we've already said enough to, to prove that it is not true. When the book of Revelation makes a statement and calls the message of John and the message of Jesus Christ through John, the spirit of prophecy, he's not talking about Ellen G. White. It is not. And yet the church has brainwashed the people to believe that John the Revelator was talking about Ellen G. White. Not true. Very important. A preoccupation with eschatology, a preoccupation with the last day events and charts and the dates of when Christ is going to come. I find it sad when friends of mine, my family, look at everything that poor Trump does and say, oh, this is a sign that Sunday laws are coming. This has been happening for 100, 150 years now. Anything happens in the world, oh, this is proof the Pope went to uh, the Middle East. Oh, this is a sign now the Sunday laws are going to come around the world. A preoccupation. The Bible tells us no man knows except God. Jesus said, I myself don't know. That time only God knows. And he spends Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 explaining the last day events. And then he finishes off. And the lesson he teaches is, don't worry about the end of time. And yet, we see Adventist big signs. We see that on Facebook. We see it all over. The oh, the end is coming. Repent. Oh, really? The end is coming. Look around you. Really? Why don't we say? Look at the God, the creator, that you may love him and want to be with him. Instead of scaring people into a denomination. The Day of Atonement. The teaching that October 22, 1844 was the beginning of the Day of Atonement in the heavenly sanctuary. That was the day that Jesus went into the most holy place. Utter nonsense. The Bible tells us when Jesus went up to heaven, he went and he took his place as our high priest at the right hand of God. And the Bible tells us back in Hebrews, the apostle Paul told us we can go boldly into the presence of God. 
And then to use a Jewish sanctuary and, and the Day of Atonement, to misuse that Day of Atonement, and not talk about the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Tents around the Day of Atonement. And what the meaning is, is an incomplete message. And a misuse of the three angels' message. The last point, twelfth point. The misuse of the three angels' message. We talk and focus on the first angel and the second angel. But the reality is, the entire purpose of the three angels is that the church may notice that there is an urgency. But the urgency is not to figure out the date of the return of Jesus Christ. That is not the urgency. What is the urgency in the three angels' message? Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is salvation by grace. That is the urgency. Not scare the people to death. The book of Revelation is not written for evangelism. And that is all the Adventist church uses for evangelism. Not the love of God. But the scary dates. Look what happened. Look what happened. Look what's happening now. And this is where we are. So you better come into the church. The book of Revelation tells us. Write to the who? To the non-believers? No. So write to the churches. The book of Revelation is written to the churches that the churches may realize to do the work that Jesus told them to do in Matthew 28. Go ye therefore teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things. The book of Revelation points the church back to that mission. To preach the gospel, not eschatology. We have covered two points of concern with regard to Ellen White that show and prove that she is not a prophet from God. Number one, that her prophecies, many of her prophecies, we listed more than a dozen that did not come true. Deuteronomy 18, Deuteronomy 13 tells us, if one prophecy is not fulfilled, you know that that prophet is not from God. So on the question of prophecy, on the question of foretelling the future, what is going to happen, Ellen White was wrong over and over and over again. Second, she claimed that she got visions from who? From God. Do you know that all the major prophets and minor prophets combined in the Bible had approximately 2,000 visions. And do you know Ellen White by herself alone had 2,000 visions? She had visions about people's personal lives. But none of her visions were legitimate. There's material on the net. By the way, I should stop for a moment. I had somebody make a point on uh, the internet uh, discourse stating that I am regurgitating information that's already out there. And that is true. I'm not claiming original research here. I really am not. And I've said that before. The information is out there. Th this information, a lot of this information was available to me while I was still in university. Because that's a great deal of work had already taken place. I was aware of the questions of Elder Canwright, who lived at the time of Ellen White, and others. We we're going to do, th do that next week, by the way. So this is not original research. And because it is not, I ask you, I challenge you, I invite you to go and do the same research as I can do. All I am doing is I am putting together information that's already there. And I'll give you an example before I continue. There are those who have challenged Ellen White on the investigative judgment. They've done a masterful job. I could never do as good a job as they've done. There are those who questioned the dating of 1844 by William Miller. 
I could never do that. They've done it. There are those who question the Sabbath as the seal of God or the mark of the beast or the 144,000. That research is already there. There are others who have done research on the false prophecies of Ellen White. There are others who've done research on Ellen White stealing the visions from others. We covered that last week. There are others who've done research on her plagiarism. I, I haven't done it. But I have not yet seen anybody who has put all of that together from all the various research to make the point that we intend to make here. Understand? So I'm not claiming any original research. I'm just compiling the research to make it contextual that we may understand the doctrines and why we reject them. So, false prophets, prophecies, we covered last week. Her visions that she stole from people, they were not visions at all. And I will cover next week in more detail, where she conveniently recorded visions based on the requests from her husband. When they needed people to behave in certain ways and follow certain things to get certain things done, he would talk to his wife and she would conveniently have a vision. Sounds a lot like the Prophet Muhammad. Today, I want to respond to the question of Ellen White using the writings of other people and claiming that they were hers. Of course, this charge has been around for as long as Ellen White was writing. And in the late 70s, it became stronger. Many have defended her. The Ellen White estate has defended and explained that Ellen White did not plagiarize, that the plagiarism was not really uh, a known uh, law by her. She didn't intentionally do that. The best summary that I have noted is by one Dr. Dwight Nelson, the senior pastor of the Pioneer Memorial Church at Andrews University, who also teaches a course at Andrews University Seminary. Perhaps the prince of preachers among the Adventist church, a sweet, sweet talker, very, very gifted. And as I review his defense of Ellen White, I marvel, I marvel at either the ignorance or willful neglect of the truth in his presentation. It surprises me. But it just so happened while I was researching some of his sermons, I felt that perhaps he should not preach with as much confidence as he does when I saw a sermon that he preached about Islam where he claimed that the God of Islam was the same God of our Bible. I knew then that Dr. Dwight Nelson has some weaknesses in his studies. And that becomes apparent in his studies and his presentation on Ellen White. I will go through point by point and respond to him with regards to Ellen White, but not today. I will briefly go over what he covered in his summary. He starts by stating this. He quotes a rabbi and he says, nobody really wants to be a prophet because a prophet lives a miserable life. A prophet is picked on by others. The prophet is persecuted. So nobody wants to be a prophet. So Ellen White would not have wanted to be a prophet unless she was a real prophet and required by God to be a prophet. 
In order to understand and to respond to that, we have to understand the life of Ellen White as compared to other prophets. I went back and did some research on Ellen White and her life of suffering. If Ellen White had not taken up this work, let's call it, of being a prophetess, she would have lived her life in misery and in poverty and perhaps not lived as long as she did. Because of her prophecies, she, she claimed and received highest honors among the people to whom she ministered. And because of her prophecies, she was able to extract funding not only from her books, but from her other participation. That before she died, she had accumulated what we would today consider about $3 million in assets. Lived out west by San Francisco in literally a mansion. She traveled in luxury, ate the best foods. In the pictures, we don't see it, but there are some pictures which show that she also dressed elegantly. She didn't have that tough life of the prophets of the Old Testament who got thrown out and who got booted around and who got persecuted and killed. Her options were few. And her claim to be a prophet gave her a life of luxury that no servant of Jesus Christ should have. Jesus calls us to a life of poverty and selflessness. Ellen White was anything but selfless. So please, Pastor Dwight Nelson, don't tell your people lies about Ellen White and her life of persecution. He goes to the book of Ecclesiastes to make a point. And there, he goes to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Toward the end of the book, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. And he uses this as evidence that it's okay to take material from other writers. Please read with me Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. Not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words. And that and what he wrote was upright and true. Your translation may say may use the word preacher instead of teacher. I went back and I did some research on this, of course, as we should. And the Bible tells us there's a big difference in the word preacher and teacher and a prophet. When the Bible refers to Nathan, it calls him what? A prophet. When it refers to Jeremiah, it calls him what? A prophet. Isaiah, what? A prophet. Even the minor prophets are called what? A prophet. This is talking about a preacher, somebody who is going to talk to a bunch of people who needs to go to sources that are already available to him, who does not claim, claim communication from God directly. And the Bible commentaries, I know Dr. Dwight Nelson knows this. Because every commentary explains this by saying, and admonishing preachers to make sure you do good research. When you go to this Bible passage, in any Bible commentary, it will tell pastors, make sure, like Solomon said, do good research before you start preaching, that your message is in fact solid. And yet, Dwight Nelson uses this to say, oh, because whatever Solomon wrote is in the Bible, that means it's from God and it's, it's, it's inspired. So if Solomon, the teacher, can take from other writers, why can't Ellen White? Why can't Ellen White? What kind of reasoning is that? 
That's a spin if you've ever seen one. And to know that this is coming from the prince of the preachers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is demeaning to any organization. The teacher is different than the preacher. In the New Testament, the word prophet can be used for a preacher because we talked about that before. When you study the word prophet, it can means it means a preacher a, 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 who, who is dealing in time, who is prophesying in time and in space. So you can prophesy something to happen in time in the future or in space to be prophesying, to be speaking in front of an audience, a congregation, a king, a leader. So that's in space. In the New Testament, it points backward. It's a proclamation. It's a preaching. So therefore, when, when Paul says that you should pray to be prophets, that you all prophesy, say, you can proclaim what has happened. There's nothing to prophesy for the future. That's already given to us. The other part that's very important to note here. When Solomon is writing this, Solomon is not writing this with the idea that someday there's going to be a canonical Bible and my writings are going to be part of that canon. My writings are going to be part of that Bible. Uh, Solomon wasn't doing that. He was just writing what's in his heart, led by God to study and write, and so others may learn that if you're going to teach, make sure you learn before you teach. That's very different than somebody who knows that there is a canonical holy scriptures that claims to be from God, that people accept from God. So let me write that my writings and my prophecies and my teachings would be even equal to that. There's a big difference when I write with that knowledge that I have to compete with or improve on what's here. Solomon wasn't doing that, but Ellen White sure was. He then goes to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and Dwight Nelson says, he misuses, by the way, this passage. And he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God for understanding and so on. All scripture. Therefore, he claims that because this is in Ecclesiastes, we must accept that whatever he says is given by inspiration. Therefore, it's from God, and so is Ellen White's. So if we can accept this, that Solomon is gathering information from other sources, then it's okay to gather sources, information from other sources. He points all to John the Revelator. It's in the book of Revelation. John uses about 20 some odd lines from the book of Enoch. And he says, oh, look. He also makes reference to pagan teaching Solomon and John. And makes reference to pagan stories. Yeah, so what? He does not change the teaching of the Bible to interfere with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He doesn't. And John was writing to the churches, the seven churches. He didn't know that his writings were going to be part of the Bible, part of the canon. But when Ellen White did, she expected fully. Because she told people that her writings were inspired by God. And they ought to be taken seriously. She threatened, in fact, to continue to support Ellen White taking material from other people, Dwight Nelson uses what is called the whole person model. And he goes, well, Matthew and Mark both took material from, sorry, uh, uh, Matthew took material from Mark and Luke took material from several sources, and Luke says that he took material from other people. Yeah. But once again, they were making a record. They were making a record 
for the sake of the benefit of the believers, not expecting their writings to be in a canonical book. They were not. And they came right out and said they were taking it. Matthew didn't. But Matthew was taking it from one of his friends, his material, and expanding on it. You cannot compare that to Ellen White. Item number five, he goes, how much material is taken? He concludes that research has been done at only 3%. 3% of her material is taken from others. But when you examine that 3%, it is such a high level of dishonesty, and I'll tell you why. The writings of Ellen White number 17 times more than the entire Bible. It's the equivalent to 17 Bibles. That's how much material she's written. And a lot of that material is just in letters and articles about people's individual lives. So she writes to this person and this person and this person and this person. And it all gets accumulated and put in a book form. So of course, 3% of all that, 17 times the size of the Bible, is not that much. But when you consider that her book, like the Great Controversy, which is the primary book about the last day events and the investigative judgment and 1844 and so on, when you consider that 20% of that is taken from others, how is it that God needs her to take material from others when she has access to God directly? When she's got this green thread that she can pull and go to God? Why does she need to take others' material? And then he points out that Ellen White did give credit for those parts of the book, The Great Controversy, where there's historical content. Well, of course she did. Because history doesn't change. She can't be pulling that out of the hat because historians would know that she's wrong. The history has to be credited that somebody else recorded this. So of course she has to. But the non-historical parts, she takes from others. And we covered some of that last week. Then he says, I can't believe he did this, but he goes to John Wesley, the great reformer, great English reformer. He says, that John Wesley, I guess Scottish, he says, a great John Wesley wrote that he chose not to credit certain writers because he did not want to distract people when they were writing by giving the references of where he got his material. Well, the difference is that John Wesley made the admittance that he got his material from somewhere else and he didn't give credit. There's a big difference. Ellen White says that every line that I write, every word that I write in these messages is from God. That's the difference in John Wesley and Ellen White. He admits it. And it was not common practice to take material from others. And John Wesley lived long before Ellen White. And if John Wesley knew that he should state that I am not giving credit, then John Wesley must have known that it's proper to give credit. And there were many writers at the time of Ellen White who wrote and gave credit. My two most important books in my library Happened to be Alfred Adersheim, Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, and Old Testament History. 65% or 65 chapters, I have to go back and check, of that book, Patriarchs and Prophets, is lifted out of Alfred Adersheim. And she claims God gave her that. How is it that God gave her? that much material, and yet she took it from others. 
I want to, next week we're going to spend more time talking about Ellen White's compatriots, those that were with her, who questioned her, who worked with her, at one time believed in her as a prophet, and later decided that she could not be a prophet of God. So next week, we will be focusing on that part, and that will be a last study on Ellen White, to see what her mates, her friends, believed. I'm going to read you two little quotes. One from Fanny Bolton, the other from Marion Davis. These were both women that worked for Ellen White and were concerned about what she was doing with regards to her writings. This is a quote from Fanny Bolton. And by the way, there are many who give Fanny Bolton more credit, in fact, give her the credit for writing the books that Ellen White claims. Let me read this paragraph. At the same time, she told Merritt G. Kellogg, this is the brother of J. Harvey Kellogg, that she was writing all the time for Sister White. Furthermore, she said, that most of what she wrote was published in Review and Herald as having been written by Sister White under inspiration of God. This is her secretary writing this now. I am greatly distressed over this matter, for I feel that I am acting deceptively in this part. Why am I reading this? Because Dwight Nelson says in his sermon, that no matter what claims people have against Ellen White, we know that righteous little two, five foot two inch lady did not intend to deceive people. This is Dwight's words. She did not intend to deceive people. Really? Now, who is deceiving? Is Dwight Nelson deceiving me and you by telling us that? Don't tell me he's not aware of this. If you're a Seventh-day Adventist preacher, you would know Fanny Bolton and her role. I am greatly distressed over this matter, for I feel that I'm acting a deceptive part. The people are being deceived about the inspiration of what I write. I feel that it is a great wrong that anything which I write should go out under Sister White's name as an article especially inspired of God. What I write should go out over my own signature. The credit would be given where credit belongs. The essence of her complaints, this is I'm still reading, as Fanny would express it to Ellen White later, when she looked back, was this. I thought, as I have always thought before, that you did not see my perplexity or comprehend my trouble. It was with your withholding of the truth about your writings and not acknowledging your editorial help that was at the bottom of all the perplexity and that your work was not, as you say, the work of God ought to be. Pastor Dwight Nelson, are you lying to your congregation and to the people worldwide about Ellen White's intention to deceive it would seem so. Her own assistant who did most of her writing makes that statement. Her other assistant, Marion, was upset and weeping herself to sleep night after night, eventually got back to the family, according to Obadiah, and they worried about her, this is the other assistant, because the health of their sister was not robust. This is the second assistant. Marion was one day heard moaning in her room. Going in, another worker inquired the cause of her trouble. Miss Davis, she replied, I wish I could die. Why? What is the matter? She was asked. 
Oh, Miss Davis, this terrible plagiarism. How simple is that? How simple is that? Don't play with the salvation of the people. Don't lead people astray. Let your families free of this lies of Ellen White and the doctrines of the STA church. Then Dwight Nelson goes on and gives a legal opinion from a firm that comes out and says, oh, Ellen White had no intent to plagiarize. That's all the legal opinion says. But the message of God, my response is this. The message of God is not about plagiarism. It's whether it teaches the word of God and supports the word of God. Now, the claim that the Ellen White does not, and the Adventist church does not hold the writings of Ellen White as equal to the Bible. Once again, a dishonest statement. Why? When you decide that the Bible has to be understood by the interpretation of Ellen White, of course Ellen White is not equal to the Bible. She is over the Bible. You understand? For me to study the Bible by the power of the Holy Spirit and for you to study the Bible as the Bible tells us, as Jesus told us, we will be shown by the Holy Spirit. To state that Ellen White would be equal to the Bible would mean that, okay, maybe I can study Ellen White. Also, the Holy Spirit will show me what Ellen White means. But the Adventist church holds that the Bible must be interpreted and must be seen through the writings of Ellen White, which means the Bible is closed to you and me, my friend. It is closed to you and I. And instead of studying the Bible, we ought to study Ellen White. Therefore, it is now above the writing of the Bible. Don't deceive people with those words, Dr. Dwight Nelson. Then he notes, Nathan the prophet went and spoke to David. And he spoke on behalf of God. And David accepted the words of Nathan as the words of God. And yet the words of Nathan are not part of the canonical Bible. And he reasons, Dr. Dwight, he reasons that if today we were to find the book of Nathan, which supposedly he has written, but we haven't found it, would we include the book of Nathan in the Bible? And he answers that. He says, no, we would not. Therefore, but it would be there. And it would be inspired. It's not part of the Bible. Therefore, Ellen White is inspired. Really? What great reasoning. What a great spin. Dr. Dwight should apply for a job at the White House. Where they regularly need to spin the news. The word of God ought not to be held that way. It not to be taught that way. Because Nathan did not contradict the word of God anywhere. Ellen White did. Nathan didn't steal the writings of anyone. Ellen White did. The prophecies of Nathan did not. Or the, 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 the findings of Nathan were not wrong. When Nathan saw the adultery of David and he went to talk to David, it was God who showed it to him. You know what Ellen White does? She writes to people. And she says, I was shown by God in vision. Now you did this and this and this. And those people are scared to death. That God showed her in vision. And she writes it in magazines and sends it to the whole world to see the brother so and so did this. And then we go out and find out that somebody wrote to Sister White about the brother who did that. Before she saw it in vision, and she says, to God, she saw it in vision. And next week, I'll share that with you. How she misused information given to her by people to manipulate and use other people and then scare the masses within the church 
that if you do wrong and don't listen to me, God is going to give me a vision. I'll know exactly what you're doing. What a great trick. Thank goodness I've studied a little bit about Islam and Muhammad because I can see a duplication here. The last point I want to make today about Ellen White and her messages is this. The Bible tells us that we ought not to depend on any one but God and especially not depend on the spirits of the dead. You remember the story when Saul went to talk to the spirit of the dead. He was punished. Let me read you from Isaiah 8, 19, 20. When men tell you to consult mediums and spirits, spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimonies that do not speak, according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 13. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium, or a spiritist, or consults the dead. Okay. It's talking about witches who consult the dead. Anyone who does these things is, is detestable to the Lord. And because of these detestable practices, the Lord of your God will drive out those nations before you. Let me read this. This is Ellen White. A little while after her husband died, writes this letter to her son. A few days since I was pleading with the Lord for light in regard to my duty. In the night, I dreamed I was in the carriage driving, sitting at the right hand. Father, James White, who's dead, was in the carriage, seated at my left hand. He was very pale, but calm and composed. Why, Father? I exclaimed. I'm so happy to have you by my side once more. I have felt that half of me was gone. Father, I saw you die. I saw you buried. Has the Lord pitied me and let you come back to me again and we work together as we used to? He looked very sad. He said, the Lord knows what is best for you and for me. My work was very dear to me. We have made a mistake. This is the dead husband talking. We have made a mistake. We have responded to urgent invitation of our brethren to attend important meetings. We had not the heart to refuse. These meetings have worn us both more than we were aware. Our good brethren were gratified, but they did not realize that in these meetings we look upon us Great, we, we took upon us greater burdens than at our age we could safely carry. We will never know the result of this long continued strain upon us. This is still a message from a dead husband. God would have had them bear the burdens we have carried for years. Our nervous energies have been continuously taxed. And then our brethren misjudging our motives and not realizing our burdens have weakened the action of the heart. I have made mistakes, he confesses. The greatest of which was in allowing my sympathies for the people of God to lead me to take work upon me which others should have borne. Now, Ellen... Calls will be made, as they have been, desiring you to attend important meetings, as has been the case in the past. But lay aside this matter before God and make no response to the most earnest invitations. Your life hangs, as it were, upon a thread. You must have quiet rest, freedom from all excitement and from all disagreeable cares. We might have done a great deal for years with our pens on the subject of people need we have had light upon and can present before them, which others do not have. Thus, you can work 
when your strength returns, as it will. And you can do far more with your pen than with your voice. He looked at me appealingly and said, You will not neglect these cautions, will you, Ellen? Our people will never know under what infirmities we have labored to serve them because our lives were interwoven with the progress of the work. But God knows it all. I regret that I have felt so deeply and labored unreasonably in emergencies regardless of the laws of life and health. The Lord will not require us to carry so heavy burdens, and many of our brethren so few. We ought to have gone to the Pacific coast before and devoted our time and energies to writing. Will you do this now? Will you, as your strength returns, take your pen and write out these things we have so long anticipated and make haste, slowly. There is important matter which the people need. Make this your first business. You will have to speak some to the people, but shun the responsibilities which have borne us down. Well said, I said. Now she's talking to her dead husband. You've always to stay with me now, and we will work together. She said, I stayed in Battle Creek too long. I ought to have gone to California more than one year ago, but I wanted to help the work and institutions at Battle Creek. I have made a mistake. So you see, she is now confessing to her dead husband the mistakes that she's made. Your heart is tender. You will be inclined to make the same mistakes I have made. Your life can be of use to the cause of God. All those precious subjects the Lord would have had me bring before the people Precious jewels of light. So what she's saying is, you've got to hang around and your life will be a great asset to my ministry. I awoke, but this dream seemed so real. This is in the records of the Adventist church. There was a time, even in the last few weeks, that I gave Ellen White the Benefit of the doubt. That maybe I ought not to call her satanic, but just say she was mistaken. But when somebody says that they're getting messages from the dead and a dead husband is helping her lead the work, that ain't God. That's not God. Sorry to hurt your feelings, my Adventist friends and family. But look. Look deeply into your salvation and the salvation of your children, your parents, your brothers and sisters. Those of you who are not Adventists of other denominations, go back and resolve in your own minds to question everything that you've been taught by your tradition in case you were taught wrong as I was taught wrong because the only thing that matters is what the Word of God, the Bible, tells us. And if there is anything in your Bible, whether it's about baptism, whether it's about salvation by grace through faith, whether it's by uh, what the law requires, I don't care what it is, just make sure you go to the Bible. This message is not just for those who are Seventh-day Adventists. It is just an example that the fastest growing church in North America or the world really is misleading the people straight to hell by a prophet who I can now say satanic because she's reading and telling us that she's getting messages from her husband who is dead. Matthew 24 Verse 36, if you go with me, I want to finish with a couple of Bible passages to warn the people that we've got to be watching that there will be false prophets coming in the last days. And we ought to be careful. Test everything. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Also, my friends, the Bible tells us that we ought to prepare ourselves to make sure that we know the only true God. That's all we're asked to do. 
and let the Spirit of God transform us. We ought not to look for dates when Christ is returning. We ought not to look to make sure that we are living a righteous life that God would find us pure, but rather that God would find us covered by Jesus Christ. Let me read you the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly dis deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. Which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to prevent the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one preached to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Very important verse 10. Am I now trying to win the approval of humans or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. One gift for which I'm grateful to the Adventist church is that we were so different from all the other Christians that I grew a thick skin growing up as a kid. And no matter what other Christians did, what they ridiculed us, I stood firm as an Adventist. As a kid, when I was in India, we were in a city called Bhopal, primarily a Muslim uh, city. In old Delhi, we lived there as well, primarily Muslim. And we stood tall. Oh yeah, we're different people, made fun of us. Hindus didn't want to eat with us or be friends with us. But we would rather choose Jesus Christ and our church. So we stood strong. We would rather keep God happy than people. And thanks to that training that today I can say, I would rather please God than man. Because my friends and family are taking shots. And they will. They will at you. And that's okay. That's okay. We have to stand for the truth of God because that is the saving grace that God promised to Abraham that through him there will be seed. There will be a promised land and through him there will be a Messiah who will bless all nations. And today, those of us that believe in Jesus Christ and his righteousness can glory in God that through his spirit we can live a righteous life. I'm not saying we live a life that is unrighteous. We live a righteous life in Christ, through Christ, through by God. But it's all to the glory of God, not to us. I implore my friends, family, to examine everything that I have said. Go back and study the Bible. Study the spirit of prophecy. Because I believe the Holy Spirit will lead you to become a stronger believer. God bless you.